Oh hi, I'm the Heretic. So, big think. A lot of you might have heard of it, but eh, it slipped under the radar for me. I mean, I consider myself politically active, so because I missed it, it can't be that big. Two million subscribers? Where the hell have I been? It, it, it's fine, just I, I don't know much about these guys, but with a name like Big Think, I'm sure it's wonderful. Hit it. We're off to a great start. I won't answer that question just yet. I'm gonna guess Mr. Steven Pinker is gonna unintentionally answer it for me. Sometimes people say that in the absence of religion, uh, there can be no moral values. And in fact, there can, for that reason, there can never be values that everyone agrees upon. We are uh, inherently conflictual. You're developing a comparison, I'm sure of it. I'd ask you to continue, but I want to address this point. Yes, you can develop a non-religious framework for getting people to internalize moral values. We have it today in children's TV shows which convey moral messages through storytelling. What's holding atheism back is that they don't know how to do this, and I say this as a practicing Catholic. Putting forward a universal framework for morality is a great place to start. Uh, the, uh, uh... You need to work on your delivery, Steve. The human condition is conflict among uh, peoples because they can just never agree on, on values. Well, putting the lie to that are developments like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 and the Millennium Development Goals, uh, where the nations of the world agreed. You mean the same Universal Declaration of Human Rights that says that no one may be compelled to belong to an association? Therefore, nobody can be compelled to associate with the priests of statism? Oh, right. I forgot. These are statist positive rights. They can only ever empower the statist priesthood. Things like Article 24, which empowers the coercive monopoly to tell you how many hours you may or may not work. Article 23, which says that you must be compelled to employ people even though that's forced association. What does Article 25 even mean by a right to a standard of living? I will not be compelled to pay for someone else's lifestyle. Parents have a prior right to choose the kind of education that shall be given to their children? Well, I don't see a problem with elementary education shall be compulsory? Oh, go away, you totalitarian-minded jackasses! Do you even know what you're writing and the kind of tyranny you need to enforce this? Everyone has duties to the community, which alone the free and full development of its personality is possible. My duty is to who I choose to associate with. Once again, I'm compelled to associate. Go home, UN. You're drunk. The U.S. needs to leave the UN and sell that building to a condo developer. Uh, having to do with health and longevity and um, uh, education, and some of which were met uh, years early, such as reduction of extreme poverty. Weird how the reduction in global poverty correlates quite strongly with the spread of capitalism or rather half-assed capitalism. Which was met several years ahead of schedule. Right now, the uh, less than 10% of the world lives in a state of extreme poverty. And the successor to the Millennium Development Goals, called the Sustainable Development Goals, calls for the elimination of extreme poverty by the 2030s. Okay, you're trying my patience. Are you gonna get to libertarianism or not? One, one development that people both on the left and the right are unaware of is that this almost an inexorable force that leads affluent societies to devote increasing amounts of their wealth to social spending, to redistribution. So much to unpack here. First off, the left and right are meaningless terms, which tells me you're trying to manipulate me. Stop it. Secondly, social spending and redistribution? What does that even mean? He's referring to spending towards children, elderly, the poor, and disabled. That sort of thing. The problem is that it tells us nothing about if it's charity or taken through force. Now, uh, the median across societies of social spending is 22% of GDP. Uh, the United States is a little bit below that, but even that's misleading because we got a lot of welfare that's done by our, by our employers. That's how we get our health insurance. That's how we get our retirement. He's going to be talking about wealth confiscation through coercive monopoly and employee benefits as though they're one and the same, isn't he? Fun fact, 
The reason that such benefits exist in the U.S. is because in the Great Depression, the Great and Wonderful New Deal prevented employers from raising wages. So to keep good employees, employers offered benefits in lieu of pay raises. Hold on a second. Isn't the anti-capitalist narrative that businesses want to pay employees as little as possible? Why would they offer these benefits if they're not legally required to? It makes no sense, unless market forces make companies give employees good benefits and wages? Nah, that couldn't be it. That would defeat the whole narrative about capitalist exploitation. Yeah, I got a bit distracted there. Please continue. Or don't. I don't care, and you're clearly lying to us, Steve. But if you add the private social spending onto the public uh, portion, the United States is actually second highest in the entire world. But this is a, a, a development sometimes called Wagner's Law, and it just seems that resistance is futile. What are you talking about? Resistance to what? So far, you haven't made any points or arguments. By the title of your video, I have to guess you're trying to explain the problem with libertarianism and welfare, but you haven't said the word libertarian once. Even conservative politicians like George W. Bush. You think George W. Bush was a conservative? <laughs> <laughs> what the fragmentation grenade is wrong with you? Georgia is about as non-conservative as they get. The guy signed the Patriot Act. No Child Left Behind, Medicare Part D, which I'm sure you'll bring up, and TARP, all of which conservatives, and yes, I do mean conservatives, not neoconservatives, oppose. You didn't come to the conclusion that he was a conservative based on an honest evaluation of his political positions or his actions as president. You think he's a conservative because, herp de der he has an R next to his name. So either you're a liar or a moron, Steve. Choose one presided over another expansion of the welfare state with his Medicare drug benefit. And the attempts by the Trump administration to repeal Obamacare, for example, were stymied by uh, you know, almost like you know, pitchfork and, and, and uh, torch-bearing angry constituents. What the hell are you even talking about? The Democrats like being able to bribe voters with Obamacare, and the Republicans love having the issue of Obamacare to campaign on. Both parties benefit from Obamacare, so they aren't going to repeal it. This is obvious. Uh, people like social spending, despite their protestations, uh, even in uh, libertarian America. You don't differentiate between government spending stolen money through welfare or private social spending through charity or employee benefits, do you, Steve? To you, they're one in the same. And in fact, the, it's probably not a coincidence that the number of libertarian paradises in the world, that is, developed states with no substantial social spending, is zero. Look how excited Stevie is. Oh, he's got us now, fellow libertards. Hundreds of years of intellectual development, logic, reason, and rationality, all gone because there are no states in history with zero social spending. Where he's clearly going with this is that libertarians are against all forms of social spending. If you're against the government stealing money to bribe voters, you must also be against your employer giving you a dental plan, because that's how it works, right? No, it's absolutely insane, and nobody with an IQ above the speed limit on a highway would even suggest that. Steve, you are lying to us. I know this because you're using such vague language. I can already hear the comments of people just saying, that's not what he said. And you know what? They're probably right. That still makes him dishonest, though, forcing us to guess what he's saying, rather than just saying it. The, the expansion of social spending shouldn't be a shock, because even if one believes in the principles of the free market, then there are just th some things that the, the market is not going to provide, by design. Steve, I know you're dishonest, but for the sake of my audience, I'll explain to you just how wrong you are. First off, by design. The market isn't designed. It's not a construct of some great central committee. It's millions of individuals making billions of decisions based on incentives and self-interest every single day. Secondly, your argument that there are things the market can't provide, that's more of an argument for your lack of imagination than it is any commentary against the market. But as long as you don't contradict your own arguments, I guess... 
no one expects that the market will provide for, for uh, poor children. It's not something that markets can do. Uh, or the elderly or the unlucky people with nothing to offer in the marketplace in exchange for which they could make a decent living. There are entire industries that market and sell exclusively for children. Clothes, food, toys. Likewise, with the elderly who reap the benefits of the employer-funded 401k retirement benefits you yourself identified earlier in this video. As for the poor, the market drives prices down so as to make goods so affordable even the poor can benefit from them. The Heritage Foundation did a study a while ago of all the amazing technology people below the poverty line have access to, the kind of stuff that fuel kings of your would have killed to have. This isn't even with the free market. It's with the corporatist, quasi-capitalist market. You're telling me, even with a half-assed market, with all the benefits, a free market still wouldn't be able to provide for them? Give me a break. And so as a kind of necessary patch or kludge, or as we say, safety net, uh, wealthy societies have to provide what the market by design cannot. This is what I don't like to see, mealy-mouthed pseudo-intellectualism that uses vague language to hide their demand for more coercion, more violent confiscation of other people's wealth. Call it charity, but with other people's money. I mean, if you actually believe this, great! Come out and present your arguments. Maybe you don't think there are enough people who will be charitable to make a difference voluntarily, or if people are going to be taxed, it might as well benefit the downtrodden directly, at least in part. Instead, it's, oh, society needs to do what a market can't, or there's a reason there's no libertarian coercive monopolies. It's the hallmark of a liar. I consider myself a patient person, but life's too short to be manipulated by totalitarian-minded morons. Here's the thing, as our prosperity grows, we can literally afford to be more charitable. This is a good thing, and the only thing standing in our way is a coercive monopoly in voluntarily being charitable on our behalf. Charity with stolen money isn't charity. It's theft. It's about time we started calling it what it is, and called out charlatans trying to trick us, Steve. At the beginning of this video, Steve tried to argue that an absence of religion does not imply an absence of morality. While I do agree, he is a poor example of this. Why the hell Steve got featured on Big Thing Channel, I'll never understand. Questions, comments, critique? In what way did you think Steve was lying to you? How long a shower do I need to take before I wash off this feeling of sliminess I got from this video? Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.